It takes passionate people, people who are sold out, heart, mind, soul, and spirit to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 12, verse 11. Here's what the Apostle Paul says. He says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Now, to this point, we've looked at the first two phrases of this passage of Scripture. The first week, we talked about never be lacking in zeal, and I talked to you about feel the zeal, because zeal is something that you feel. We talked about that the word zeal means energy and enthusiasm and intensity. And that the Apostle Paul says that when it comes to doing the work of the Lord, that we should not be lazy. That's what the word lacking means there, lazy or slothful or slow. But that we should do the Lord's work with energy and with enthusiasm and with intensity. That's what he's saying to us there. And then last week I talked to you about keeping your spiritual fervor and that it is our responsibility individually to keep our spiritual fervor. I can try and inspire you as your pastor. I can try and preach messages or teach lessons that inspire you, but I cannot keep your spiritual fervor. I can't keep your spiritual fire burning. That's something that you have to be responsible for. You've got to make sure that you're continually putting another log on the fire, your spiritual fire, to keep your spiritual fervor. And that word fervor, as we looked at last week, means hot or to boil or to glow. And God does not want us to be lukewarm. He he said to the church at Laodicea, he said, I'd rather you be hot, that is full of zeal, or cold. But if you're lukewarm, he said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. And as I said last week, the other churches got him mad, but the church at Laodicea made him sick. Because a lukewarm church, a church that lacks passion, and how can we as followers of Christ, how could we ever lack passion after all that God has done for us? That's why Jesus said that the greatest and the first commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul and with all of your mind. God doesn't want us loving him and serving him half-heartedly. God wants us to love him with all of our heart. And he wants us to serve him with all of our heart. And so today I want to talk to you on this last phrase of this passage of Scripture. This is not the end of the series. But I do want to talk to you today about serving the Lord. And that's what this whole passage is about. It's about serving the Lord with zeal. And it's about serving the Lord with fervor. And as I said, today I want to talk to you about people of passion. And I want to try to introduce you today to one man in particular from Scripture and then to a few others from church history that I hope will inspire you today to become a person of passion, a purpose of passion. Now let me tell you about passionate people. Here's here's what I've discovered about passionate people. And I say this in a positive, not a negative way. And that is that positive people are dangerous people. Positive people are dangerous people. Matter of fact, I almost entitled the message today, Dangerous Passion. Because passion for God can be dangerous. Notice what the Bible tells us in the book of Luke chapter, I'm sorry, this thing is, uh, is getting ahead of me. Luke chapter 10, verse 3. Jesus, when he is sending his disciples out to do ministry, sends them with this challenge. He says, go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Now, I'm just going to tell you right now, that don't sound safe to me. That sounds dangerous to me. I mean, Jesus is giving these disciples forewarning. He said, I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. Well, I think we all know what wolves like to do to lambs. 
They like to kill lambs and they like to eat lambs for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Now, how would you feel if that were Jesus saying that to you? And in a sense, he does say that to us this morning. That as his disciples, he sends us out as lambs among wolves. Now, let me back up here for just a moment and talk to you about that word dangerous. Because dangerous, passionate people are dangerous people. And that word dangerous means just simply involving possible injury, harm, or even death. Now, I told you last week, if there's one thing that God will not allow us to be, and one thing that I, as your pastor, will not allow you to be is complacent. I'm always going to be challenging you to come out of your complacency. I'm always going to be challenging you to, to, to come out of your comfort zone because there is no place for complacency in the body of Christ, in the army of God. And I talked to you last week and I described to you that complacency is when we live our lives as if we don't want to offend the devil. Listen, I don't care if I offend the devil. And I don't care if I offend the devil's people. I really don't. You're not looking at a person who cares about trying to be politically correct. I'm just, I'm just passionate about doing what God has put in my heart to do. And I'm sure that you feel the same way. But that word dangerous, it involves possible injury, harm, or death. Now that's something that you probably did not hear when you came to Jesus, when you come to Christ. You probably heard, well, it's as simple as praying a little prayer. Just repeat after me. And yes, you have to believe in your heart that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. And yes, you have to confess it with your mouth. But can I tell you, there's more involved to being a disciple and a follower of Christ than just praying a prayer after a minister. Again, Jesus said to his disciples, I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. He said this in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. He said, do not fear those who kill the body. Well, why would he tell them that? Because many of his followers had already lost their lives because of their profession of faith and the profession of the gospel. But Jesus said, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. But he goes on and he says, fear the one, talking about God, who does have the power to kill both the body and the soul. But he warns us here and he says, do not fear those. Why? Because death could be possible as a follower of Jesus. Now, I know that we don't think in those terms much here in Summerton, Alabama, where the majority of people are followers of Christ. But you travel to other places in this world and listen to me, there are still people who are dying as martyrs. As a matter of fact, last year, more people died for the Christian faith than any other year up until this point in church history. So there are still people who are dying because of their profession of faith. And people who are dying, but they face it with no fear. And the reason why they face it with no fear is because they know that if they die for the sake of the gospel, that God is going to raise them up to eternal life. Amen? At the great day. And, and so they didn't fear death. They, and, and many all over the world today, they don't fear death. They are dangerous, passionate disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here's what I want to do this morning. I want to share with you, and, and, and several months ago, the Lord put this on my heart to share with a few men in a class, but I wanted to share this with the entire congregation today. The three most passionate statements, and really the most dangerous statements, that you and I could ever make or say as followers of Jesus Christ. And the first most dangerous passionate statement that we could make or say as disciples of Jesus is this, Lord, I will follow you. I don't think we understand the magnitude of that statement. Look at what happened here in Matthew chapter 8, verses 19 through 22. It says that a certain scribe came and said to Jesus, Teacher, 
I will follow you. But notice he didn't just say, I will follow you. He said, I will follow you wherever you go. Oh, you better watch out. When you tell Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go because there's not much places Jesus won't go. Because Jesus feared no man and Jesus didn't fear anything. And so Jesus went into some pretty dangerous places. He went into some places even knowing that it could cost him his life. And so this young scribe comes to the Lord and says, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And so Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, son, you just need to know this, that if you're saying you will follow me wherever I go, you, you may not know where your next meal is going to come from. You, you may not know where you're going to lay your head to sleep tonight because that's just how uncertain and unpredictable life is following me. In other words, it takes a person of passion, a person of danger that will follow the Lord Jesus Christ. He went on and even said this. He said that another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me go first before I follow you. Let me go first and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Now that sounds pretty serious to me there. It almost sounds like Jesus is being unkind here. But, but you see, this, this young man, Jesus could see right through him. He was trying to make some kind of an excuse to keep from following Jesus at that moment. You, you see, he knew that when his father died, that he, being the oldest son, would get his father's inheritance. And not only that, but what would his father think if he left the family business to follow this itinerant evangelist by the name of Jesus? Maybe he would disown him and write him out of the will. But Jesus said that being obedient to me even takes priority over loyalty to your family. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you this morning? That being obedient to Jesus, being a passionate follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, even takes priority over loyalty to your family is what he's saying here. You see, this is something nobody told you when you said, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. But you need to understand that you've got to be a passionate follower of Jesus. You, you've got to be willing to face danger if that's what it takes. Notice what Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. He said, if anyone desires to come after me, that is to be my follower, let him deny himself, take up the cross daily. Now, what was a cross? A cross was an instrument of execution. It, it, it was like a, an electric chair today. And so when he said, take up your cross, he was saying to them, you've got to be willing to die. And it's possible that you will die. And when you go back and study the lives of the, the, the disciples and the apostles, most every one of them, save a couple, died a martyr's death. And he said, you've got to be willing to take up your cross. When? Daily. Every day of your life. And follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. In other words, Jesus is letting us know that there is a price. There is a cost. It takes passionate people. People who are sold out heart, mind, soul, and spirit to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And I want to introduce you this morning to a gentleman who was just that. A gentleman by the name of A.W. Milne. We don't know when he was born, but he died April the 27th, 1937. His father, years before him, had it in his heart to go to a newly discovered area of islands called the New Hebrides in the South Pacific Ocean. The other missionaries who had gone to those islands had all been killed and eaten by the cannibals on those islands. And other missionaries had gone and had been forced to leave the islands. But Peter Milne, A.W. Milne's father, was what became known as one-way missionaries. It was a group of missionaries that became popular around the turn of the 20th century. And let me tell you what a one-way missionary was. 
A one-way missionary was not somebody who packed their belongings in a suitcase. A one-way missionary was somebody who packed their belongings and shipped them in a coffin because they knew that they were going to be giving their life doing what God had put in their heart to do, and they were passionate about doing the will of the Lord. And so Peter Milne goes to the New Hebrides, and while he's there, A.W. Milne, his son, is born. And when they got there, there was not a believer anywhere on the particular island that they went to. But when A.W. Milne died, the natives of that island put this on his tombstone. They said that when he came, there was no light. But when he left, there was no darkness. Hallelujah. That's passion. That's somebody who says, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And God took him to the darkest of dark places. And when he got there, there were no believers. But when he left, every person on that island was a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that when he left, there was no darkness. That's my passion for this community of Summit and Dora, East Walker County. I know that number 32,689 sounds big. But when I leave this place to go home to be with the Lord, I would love for you to be able to put that on my tombstone. That when he came, there wasn't a whole lot of light. But when he left, there was no darkness. Amen. We're going to transform this community. We're going to be light and eliminate the darkness in this place. Amen. It's dangerous to say, Lord, I will follow you, but that's what passionate people do. Here's another dangerous statement that passionate people make, and that is, Lord, I want to be led by your Spirit. Have you ever gotten up in the morning and prayed, Lord, just lead me today? Lord, just you guide me by your spirit today. I don't think you realize how dangerous that could be. That was the prayer that the Apostle Paul made. That he wanted to be led by the Holy Spirit. And in the middle of him doing missionary work in Ephesus, the Lord speaks to him and tells him that it's time for him to go back to Jerusalem. But the problem is they've told him that if you ever come back to Jerusalem, we're going to kill you. But notice what the Apostle Paul says in Acts chapter 20. Beginning at verse 22, he said, and see, he said, now. He's saying this to the Ephesian elders who are begging him, Paul, please don't go. Paul, they've said that they're going to kill you. Paul, they've said they're going to take your life. But Paul says, now I go bound in the spirit. In other words, I don't have any choice in the matter. I sold out to God. I told him to lead me by his Holy Spirit and I would be obedient to him. And he said, so now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city saying that chains and tribulations await me. Oh, but I thought God only called us to go to places of safety. I thought God only called us to go to places where we could be comfortable. No, Paul is saying the only thing that the Holy Spirit has told me about where I'm going is that there's going to be chains and that there's going to be tribulations that await me. Well, Paul, what are you going to do? He said, but none of these things move me nor do I count myself dear or, or count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. In other words, Paul says, I know what's waiting on me when I get there and I know that I could possibly die for my faith and die as I proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and die when I confront those religious Pharisees. But he said none of those things moved me because I died a long time ago to myself you see you can't threaten a dead man with death and if you've already died to the Lord if you've already died to the purpose if you've already died to the will of God for your life then when somebody threatens to kill your body that doesn't cause you to be afraid because you're already dead to yourself you're already dead to your own will and to your own ways Reminds me of another missionary by the name of John Patton. John Patton was born in 1824. He was another of those one-way missionaries who packed all of his belongings in a coffin. 
He also would have a passion for the islands, the New Hebrides. He would pack up his wife and their belongings and take a seven-month trip by boat to get to Tana, one of the islands of the New Hebrides. When he gets there in November, the following March, his wife passes away because she has the fever. Just a couple of months before, she had given birth to his only child, his son, who just months after his mother passed away, he also passed away, which left John Patton on this island of Tana by himself. And for four years, he passionately served. And again, it was an island of cannibals. It was an island that was filled with headhunters. And every missionary that had been there before him had lost their life or been driven from those islands, but that didn't stop him from doing what God had put in his heart to do. But after four years there, they would drive him off of that island. He would go back to his home and prepare. And four years later, he would come back to another island called Anawa. And he would spend the rest of his life in Anawa doing the ministry that God had put in his heart to do. And when he made the announcement that he was going to go to Anawa after his experience at Tana, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Dixon spoke up and said, but John, the cannibals, what about the cannibals? They'll kill you and they'll eat you. To which John Patton replied to him, Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years now. And your body will soon be laid in the grave to be eaten by worms. Then he goes on and he says this, If I can live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it'll make no difference to me whether I'm eaten by cannibals or by worms. And then he said this, and he said, In the great day, my resurrection body will rise as fair as yours in the likeness of our risen Redeemer. And he goes back to Anawa. And when he died, they found written in his journal these words. He said, I claimed Anawa for Jesus. And by the grace of God, Anawa now worships at the Savior's feet. Another island where every single inhabitant of that island came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And listen to me, they are still feeling the impact of those ministries even today in that that group of islands. It's not called the New Hebrides anymore, but those 80 islands, listen to me, between all of those 80 islands to this day, 80% of the population of those, of, the, of those islands are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, are Christians, are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because there were men and women who were passionate enough to say, I'm not going to let the threat of danger keep me from doing what God has called me to do because in the face of danger, I'm more dangerous than the danger is. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah brings me to one more statement that perhaps could be the most dangerous, passionate statement that any of us could make, and that is, God, I just want to be in the center of your will. I know what some of you are thinking, but pastor, isn't that the safest place to be? You've heard it said that way before, and I understand what people are saying when they say that, that the safest place to be is in the center of God's will. Don't tell the apostle Paul that. Because the center of God's will was not necessarily the safest place for him physically. It was the most dangerous place for him. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He said, I have worked much harder. Because you see, passionate people don't mind hard work to do what God's called them to do. He said, I have worked much harder. He said, I have been in prison more frequently. You don't mind being locked up for the sake of the gospel when you're a passionate believer and a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. He said, I have been flogged more severely and been exposed to death again and again. Five times, he said, I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one, that is 39 stripes on my back. 
He said three times I was beaten with rods. Do you know what that means? That means that they would throw him down on his stomach. Somebody would keep their foot on his head or his neck. And then another would reach and pull his feet up. And with rods, they would beat the bottom of his feet. Maybe that's why when he came to the end of his life, he said, only Luke is with me. Why? Luke was a doctor. Luke was a physician. I think Luke had to stay with Paul in order to keep him bandaged up, in order to keep him healthy, in order to keep him strong to do what God had called him to do. But he said, five times I was beaten. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. And that was when he was in Lystra, literally stoned to the point of death. He said, three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. Do you want to know if the will of God is safe or dangerous? Listen to what he says. He said, I have confidence constantly been on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false brothers. Don't tell me that the center of God's will is the safest place. Paul would say it's the most dangerous place. He said, I have labored and I've toiled and I've often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and I've often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. But you see, people who are passionate about what God has called them to do, aren't, they're not moved by the discomfort. They're, they're not moved by the inconveniences. The only thing that moves them is the call of God and the anointing of God and the fervor of God and the zeal of God to do what it is that God has called them to do. Listen to what he says in in verse 28 he said beside everything else he said I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches and then in verse 32 this is crazy to me he said in Damascus the governor under King Artus had the city of the Damascenes guarded in order to arrest me but he said I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall and slipped through his hands this sounds like something out of an action movie doesn't it I mean this is the apostle Paul living life on the edge his life constantly being in danger but he was so passionate about what God had called him to do that when he does get to the end of his life what does he say I have fought me a good fight I have finished my course I have kept the faith and henceforth there is now laid up for me a crown of righteousness you see that's how Paul felt about his ministry he was passionate he didn't mind the danger. He didn't mind the discomfort. He didn't mind the inconveniences. God help us today. Because we play it so safe. And it's all about our convenience and it's all about our comfort. Jim Elliott. You notice he was only like 28, 29 years old when he died. I love to read autobiographies. I told you last week that if you want to be a passionate person, you've got to hang out or read about passionate people. I'm going to tell you if, you, if you want to be inspired to be a person of passion, you need to read the story of Jim Elliott. When Jim was about 24 years old, he left Washington by boat, waved by to his parents because he knew that loyalty to God preceded loyalty to family. And what God had called him to do was go to Ecuador. And God had given him a burden to preach the gospel to the Alka Indians. So somewhere around 24 to 25 years old, he gets on the boat. 18-day journey to Quito, Ecuador. Pete Fleming, his partner, with him, they spent their first year in Quito, Ecuador, learning the Spanish language. The next three years... They would spend sharing the gospel with different villages throughout the jungles of Ecuador, preparing themselves for where they ultimately wanted to be, and that's sharing the gospel with the Aka Indians. And so after a few years of ministering to those tribes in the jungle, Jim Elliott began to feel that it was time for them to plan to take the gospel to the Aukas. Now, you've got to understand the Aukas as well were cannibalistic people. 
Anybody who would come into their territory, outsiders that would come into their territory, every single one of them had lost their life. They weren't driven out, they were killed. They were martyred or murdered. And so Jim had a friend who was a pilot. And the pilot came up with an idea. He said, why don't we just fly over their village and for at least a few months, let's just drop gifts and supplies down to them to try to prepare their hearts to receive us. And so they did that for a few months. They would fly over and they would drop down packages of food and other resources and gifts. And the Aukas evidently began to appreciate it because they would then put gifts in buckets and send it back up to the plane. And so Jim Elliott felt like that was his sign that it was time to move in and take the gospel to those Aukas. And so here's what the pilot did one by one. Now, I, I've often wondered if you were that very first missionary to be dropped on that, the, the, the Aukan beach because they dropped one missionary one day and then they would come back and drop another missionary the next day. But that first missionary was there for 24 hours by themselves until finally there were about seven missionaries. And then the pilot flew back over the Aukan village and invited them to go and meet with the missionaries. And at that time, one man and two ladies showed up, sat down, talked with Jim Elliott and some of the other missionaries. And after they had a meal together, the gentleman and the two ladies left and went back to their village. They didn't see any sign of them for the next several days. But six days later, two other Alka women showed up on the other side of the little canal where they were. And when Jim Elliott and another missionary saw them, they jumped in the water to swim to the other side to greet them. And when they got about halfway over, they heard a horrible scream behind them. And when they turned around, it was Alka men, Indians, the warriors had come out of the woods with their spears, with their bows and arrows. It was an ambush. They had been tricked. And Jim Elliott, even though he had a firearm on him, his wife would later write and say that he had made a commitment that he would never take the life of an Aukan who had not yet heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And because they had not had the opportunity to share the gospel, he refused to take his firearm and kill any of those. And every single one, seven to eight of those missionaries, perished that day on that beach. Just six days after arriving to take the gospel to those Aukan Indians. But they would later find Jim Elliott's journal. And in his journal, he wrote these words. He said, we are so utterly ordinary, so commonplace. While we profess to know a power the 20th century does not reckon with. But we're harmless and therefore unharmed. He goes on and he says, we are spiritual pacifists, non-militants, conscientious objectors in this battle to the death with principalities and powers in high places. Meekness must be had for contact with men, but brass, outspoken boldness is required to take part in the comradeship of the cross. Then he made this statement. He said, we are sideliners, coaching and criticizing the real wrestlers while content to sit by and leave the enemies of God unchallenged. And then he goes on and he says, to conclude that statement, the world cannot hate us. We are too much like its own. Lord, make us dangerous. That's my heart. That's my prayer this morning, Summit and Church of God. Lord, make us dangerous. Make us so passionate for you, Lord. Make us so passionate for your cause. Do you know that Jesus was so passionate about us that he was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice? On our behalf, and not just willingly, but he did offer his life. He did give himself up for us because of how much he loved us and because of how passionate he is for us. 
And listen to me. God is calling the church out of her comfort. God is calling the church out of her place of convenience. God is calling the church out of her place of complacency. Because listen, passionate people are not comfortable people. Passionate people are not, not, not moved by convenience. Passionate people, they're, they're, they're moved by, by what it is that causes them to be passionate. And nothing, nothing is going to stop them. And I'm just going to tell you here this morning, nothing is going to stop this boy right here. Nothing is going to stop me. Nothing or no one is going to stop me because God has lit a fire in my spirit and God has lit a fire in my soul to eliminate the darkness of this community. And I will not be denied and I will not get sucked into comfort and I will not get sucked into convenience and I will not get sucked into all of those kinds of things. I will not worry about, as I said, trying to be politically correct. All I care about is Father your kingdom come and your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven I don't care what it costs me did you hear me I don't care what it costs me I don't care what it costs me because he's worthy he's worthy <laughs> he's worthy <laughs> I'm like the collector of pearls. And Tanya, you can come. I'm like the collector of pearls who had spent his entire life collecting pearls. And if you were to show up at his house, and this is a parable in the Bible, if you were to have shown up at his house, he would say, hey, if you got a minute, come back here. I want to show you my collection of pearls. I mean, I've got the most beautiful collection. I've got pearls from all over the world. I've, I've collected pearls from all over the place. I want you to come and see my, my pearls. But then one day, he encounters somebody who has a pearl unlike he had ever seen before. And do you know what his passion drove him to do? His passion drove him to take his entire collection of pearls and say, here, I'll give you all of this for that one pearl. See, that's how passionate we need to be for Jesus. To say, I'm going to give you everything that I thought was valuable. Everything that I thought was meaningful. Everything that I thought was worth something. But now that I've met you, Jesus, I realize none of this compares to you. He is the pearl of great price. And I say to you this morning, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's more than just a prayer that you pray as the preacher tells you what to say. It's a life long commitment to deny yourself and to take up your cross and to follow him.